I pray that you would give us hearts that are responsive and minds that are open and hungry for the knowledge of the truth and desire us to grow in our faith. Please bless this time as we work through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple things. So we spent a lot of time looking at the way Jesus talked about the Old Testament, Paul talked about the Old Testament, and Peter talked about the Old Testament. We saw how the Old Testament needs to be read Christocentrically, meaning with the lens of how does it point to Jesus? How is Jesus found in the Old Testament? Then we looked at different ways to divide the Old Testament. So, quick questions. What language is the Old Testament primarily written in? Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, and the, the threefold division of the Old Testament. The Hebrew one word is the Tanakh, which stands for what three sections? Torah, the law, Navim, the prophets, Katuvim, the writings. Okay, so the Old Testament Bible was arranged differently. You had the law, the prophets, the writings. That's how the Jews had the Old Testament. Then all of a sudden, um, a couple hundred years before Jesus, a translation of the Old Testament happened. What do we call that? Septuagint. The Septuagint. The Septuagint, which uh, stands for 70. And if you remember, what country was that translation taking place in? In Egypt. But it was in what language? Greek, Greek right. And so they took the Hebrew Old Testament and they translated it into the Greek language. Why is that important for us? Because our English Bible, while translated from Hebrew into English, does not follow the Hebrew order. What does it follow? The Septuagint's order, okay? The titles of our English Bible do not follow the Hebrew Bible. Instead, they follow what? The Septuagint's titles. So that's why you see differences between the Hebrew Bible and the English Bible, because our English translation follows the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That was all last week. If you didn't hear it, I encourage you to go back and listen and get caught up. It's actually really important to help you understand why our Bible is the way it is. So you can turn to Genesis, which isn't going to be hard, because it's page one or something like that. And um, we are going to begin tonight actually diving in and thinking through the Old Testament. So we said again that the titles of the Hebrew Bible are different than the titles of the English Bible. So, for instance, if you pick up a Hebrew Bible today, the title of the book of Genesis is actually the word Bereshit, which does not mean Genesis. It is actually the first Hebrew word of the Bible in the beginning. Bereshit is simply translated in the beginning. However, our English Bible follows the Septuagint's Greek uh, translation, Genesis. And so um, there's a, a noticeable difference right there as we dive in. Why is that? Because again, we're following the Greek translation for our titles and our order. So this is a book of beginnings. And I love this quote from John Lennox to get us started tonight. I think it's very helpful. He says, both Genesis and science say that the universe is geared to supporting human life. But Genesis says more. It says that you, as a human being, bear the image of God. The starry heavens, the sky above, the constellations, the galaxies, they show the glory of God. But they are not made in God's image. You are. That makes you unique. It gives you incalculable value. The galaxies are unimaginably large compared to to each one of you here tonight. However, you know that they exist, but the galaxies don't know that you exist. You are more significant than a galaxy. Wow, that's quite a thought. Now, I want to get all man-centered here, but actually Genesis is centered around God's making us in his image. So there is something to that idea. The creation doesn't bear his image. Man does bear his image. In the beginning, foundationally. So a few things to think about. Again, the first word of the Hebrew Bible, um, when you pick up a Hebrew scroll or a Hebrew text, is Bereshit, in the beginning. That's the title of the book. In the Greek translation, it's Genesis. That's the title above the book, which means birth, genealogy, 
or origins or the account of the origin. Very important to understand that. This is a book about the creation of the world and humanity and our origins. And so um, when you read this book, you see in chapter one and two, the origin of the world. And then in chapter three, you see the origin of sin. In chapter nine, you see the origin of the new creation. There's kind of a recreation of the world after Noah. And then if you keep going, you see the origin of Israel and God's plan for blessing the world in Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham. And that's through 12 through 50. It's also interesting that the book of Matthew in the New Testament begins the exact same way the first book of the Old Testament begins. And I want to remember I said we want to understand the Old Testament Christocentrically, Christ centered. So it's interesting that uh, this book is called Genesis. One of the key words in the book is the origins or the account of or the generations of Genesis. And the New Testament begins the same way. Remember how Matthew 1 begins? The book of the Genesis in Greek of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, to us as Westerners in 2021, it may seem very tedious to start a book uh, of the Bible with a genealogy or origins. We want to get to the story, right? It's kind of a waste of space. I don't care who your mom and dad was, right? Not so in God's eyes. Actually, that story is vitally important to us. Jews kept extensive genealogies. And you needed to know what tribe of Israel you were from. Were you a descendant of King David or not? Were you of the priestly tribe of Levi? All of these questions were very important. So Matthew is kind of echoing the Old Testament first book. This is the genesis of Jesus Christ, the origins. We're going to see in Genesis the same idea over and over and over again. So, for instance, a few examples of this, but it's also found in chapter 6, 10, 11, 27, Genesis 2. These are the Genesis, or the genealogy of the heavens and earth when they were created in the day that God made the earth and the heavens. And then Genesis 5, we see the first human list. This is the book of the generations, all right, the Genesis of Adam, when God created man. And then another example, very clear in Genesis 37, verse 2. These are the genesis, the origins of Jacob and his descendants. And you have a list there. So these are genealogical tables telling us origins. Now, why does Matthew begin this way? And why is Genesis talking about this? What's the tie-in here? Well, the tie-in is that Jesus is so much the focal point of history that all of his ancestors and all of human history and origins depend on Jesus for their meaning. In other words, God is so sovereign and in control of all things. He directed the history of the creation of the world, the history of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, to bring Jesus to us today, which is pretty staggering. So begin by saying Genesis origins, Matthew, genealogy, or the Genesis of Jesus Christ. How do we get him? These two books are very much tied together in thought, and we're going to see that as we continue on looking at Genesis. So let's talk about the authorship of Genesis. I believe that Moses was the primary author of what we call, not, yes, the Torah in Hebrew, but what's the Greek word when you're thinking of the Septuagint, the what? Pentateuch, right? The first five books of Moses. By the way, uh, Brother Frank Butler asked last week, so Pentateuch means five books, and I explained the etymology of that word, and then he said, what is the etymology of Pentecost? And he stumped me. I said, we have to Google that one. I don't remember. I know it means 50, but I don't know the etymology. Well, here it is, all right? In the English language, you have five, 50, four, 40, all right? Penta, five, Pentateuch, 50. There is no secret meaning behind that, okay? Just, pen, uh, excuse me, Penta 5, Pentecost 50. Let me get that right. No secret meaning behind it. It's just like saying 5 or 50. That's the only difference, just to let you know. Now, I wanted to answer his question. He's not here tonight, but maybe he'll listen later on. So, 
when we're talking about the author of Genesis and the entire Pentateuch, the first five books, I want to argue tonight that Moses was the primary author of these books. And there's a lot of reasons for that that we'll see this evening. When we think about the history of Israel and the history of Moses in particular, we know a few things. We know according to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7, Moses lived 120 years. And God was really nice to us Bible college students and Christians today, and he chose to sovereignly intervene in Moses' life in periods of 40. So uh, that was just grace, so we didn't have to remember 39, 37, uh, 41 or something, okay? He just was trying to, this was like God threw us a bone here to help us remember Moses' life really easy. So think about this, all right? It's pretty cool. When you break down Moses' life, you have the first 40 years of his life spent in Egypt as an adopted son of Pharaoh, learning, according to Acts chapter 7, the wisdom of the Egyptians. That's what Acts 7.22 says. So we think he lives like in the 16th century and the 15th century B.C. A good date approximation would be 1527, he's born, 1484, he has that event in God's providence with the death of the Egyptian worker, and he has to flee for his life from the nation of Egypt, the kingdom of Egypt. And he flees to a place called Midian, a very important place in Israeli uh, biblical history. And he spends the next 40 years of his life getting married and living in the desert as a shepherd. Okay, living as a shepherd. And you've all heard preachers joke and say, Moses didn't even begin his ministry until he was 80. So you seniors in the room have no excuse, okay? Um, he didn't even begin doing his ministry of leading Israel out of Egypt, his time in the wilderness, until uh, the exodus from Egypt was in about 1446. And then 1447 to 1407, he's with the Jewish people for 40 years, leading them in the wilderness. It was during that last segment of time that we believe he completed the work of Genesis, the Deuteronomy. Okay? He started it at the beginning of that period when he gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And God had him in the wilderness 40 years. There's not a whole lot to do but deal with grumbling Israelites and finding them food and, and uh, coaching the people and raising up leaders. That's what Moses did for 40 years. And <clears throat> during that time, he also, I believe, gave us what we have in the Pentateuch and in particular, the book of Genesis. So here's some verses to consider to show us. We're going to read through them very quickly that Moses is the author. And there's more evidence than this. This is just some very good and helpful ones. So first off, in Exodus 17, Yahweh speaks to Moses and directly commands him. He says, write this, the events that happened with the Amalekites, as a memorial in a book. So he's commanding him to write down the events of history and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I am going to utterly blot out the memory of Amalek, who is the founder of the Amalekites, from the earth. So we have a direct command in the record for Moses to write down the events of what happened. In Numbers 33, we see there Moses wrote down Israel's starting places stage by stage by command of the Lord. So how do we know what Israel was doing and where Israel was going those 40 years in the wilderness? God had Moses write them down. It, it's telling us that itself. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 24, nearing the end of the book, when Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book, and by the way, remember, when we read the word book, what should we actually read? Scroll, because there were no books, no printing press. That's just to help us in our English 2021 minds. Um, to write them in a book or a scroll to the very end. And then in Joshua 1, verses 7 and 8, God, this is after Moses is dead. God's speaking to Joshua and commissioning him to lead Israel. And he says, be strong and courageous. Be careful to do all the law that who? Moses commanded you. And don't turn from it. And then he says, meditate on it day and night. And do everything that's written in it. So clearly, God is revealing to Joshua that Moses was the one who gave the law. He was behind that. Which would make up? Exodus, Leviticus, some of Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? Those would be sections written by 
Moses. A few more passages just to show you this. In Joshua 8, it says there, Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it is written in the scroll of the law of Moses. Now, that's all uh, contemporary to Moses' life. Let's push forward in Israel's history a whole bunch. Let's get to the the post-exilic time in Israel's history. The book of Ezra, chapter 6. It says there, They set the priests of Israel in their divisions and the Levites in their divisions for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written. How did they learn how to to distribute the, the, the priest? As it is written where? In the law of who? They looked at Moses as the giver of the law and who recorded the law for the people. We could jump forward farther in Israel's history to the New Testament and to the life of Jesus. We've already seen how Jesus talked about the Old Testament. He cherished it and treasured it. Notice it says here in Matthew 19 that the religious leaders question Jesus and they say, why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send his wife away? And Jesus answers and says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses did this. Talking about the divorce laws in the Old Testament. Not only did the religious leaders think Moses wrote it down, Jesus thought Moses wrote it down. That's a pretty good testimony to Moses being the author, if Jesus said so. Or, how about in Mark 7, where it says there, Moses said, honor your father and mother. He's quoting the Ten Commandments there, the Fifth Commandment, Jesus says. And then in verse 13, he says, you make void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. He's calling Moses' words the what? The word of God. The command Moses gave is the word of God. Very important. All right. Luke 16, verse 29. The parable, or some people say it's a real story, of the rich man and Lazarus. Okay? Lazarus is cast into Hades. There's a conversation going on. Um, Excuse me. Lazarus goes with Abraham in his bosom, which means he's next to Abraham. The rich man is cast into Hades, into hell, in torment. And there's this conversation that happens where the rich man says, Abraham, please go back to my family. Warn them, right? I don't want them to suffer the same fate as me in hell. And you'll notice here that Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So Abraham is saying that who is the author of those books? Moses. Moses is the author of the first five books. I know I'm beating this maybe to death, but I just want to make it very clear because of what we're going to see in a moment. Um, Just a few more, all right? And we're going to get into some things. Luke 24, Jesus began with Moses and all the prophets interpreting the scriptures. It doesn't say he began with Genesis or Bereshit. He he began with in the beginning. No, The, the author here, Luke, summarizes Jesus' teaching as the teaching of Moses, like he was the author. He was, when you read Genesis, you're reading Moses. When you're reading Exodus, you're reading Moses. John 5, 45. Do not think that I accuse you to the Father. This, there is one who accuses you. Who? Moses. Moses does. John 7, this is the the context of circumcision, right? Moses gave you circumcision. Where do we first find circumcision in the Bible? Does anyone know? Where at? First, first appearance of circumcision. Who's the first guy to get circumcised? Abraham, Genesis 17. So that's not even Exodus, the law. That's the, the book we're looking at tonight, Genesis. All right, there you go. Um, Acts 15. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of who? To Moses? 2 Corinthians 3, to this day, wherever Moses is read, a veil lies over the heart of the Jewish people. Wherever Genesis is read, Exodus is read, no. Wherever Moses is read. Pretty definitive from Paul's testimony there. And then uh, one last one, Acts 7, 22. Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words, and Moses was mighty in his words deeds. That's very important. Why is that important? Well, because in order to write Genesis through Deuteronomy, you've got to be pretty smart. Um, Did everyone go to school 
3,400 years ago during the days of Moses. Was there public education, private schools, Christian schools? I don't think so. Was there education in Egypt? Yes. Was it for everybody? No. Okay. Uh, who was it for? The rich, the wealthy, and royalty. Royalty. And Genesis through Deuteronomy is a very lofty piece of literature. Creation literature, historical st st stories, poetry, laws. Like, when you think about the founders of this country who come up with the Constitution, and then people who write the Bill of Rights and things like that, these men were what? Brilliant. The Constitution doesn't hold a candle to Moses' law in terms of thoroughness and beauty of language and explicit attention to detail. Well, that's because God gave Moses the words, but it's also because Moses had the education, the grammar, the intellect to be able to record them in such a very fluent and beautiful and powerful way. So this book, by the way, it's very interesting. Moses writing as a highly educated son of a king uses the greatest percentage of Egyptian words in the Old Testament. The author was very influenced and very knowledgeable of Egyptian. That would be a very important, right? If it was Moses as the author. Also, there are eyewitness details that only Moses could have given in the book. Like, for instance, I'll just give you one. There's two examples here. Um, Exodus 15, they come to a place called Elam. And where there was 12, notice this, there was 12 springs of water in Elam. And there was 70 palm trees. And they, they were camped out by the water. Now, you say, oh, that's an easy detail to figure out. Um, who here has went camping before? Who likes to go camping? How many of you, when you went camping, counted how many trees were around the lake? Right? You do that when you're stuck with a people for 40 years, the same people, okay? You walk around the lake about 300 times, and you get so bored you start counting. Only an eyewitness knows that there are 70 palm trees and remembers there are 12 springs of water at this camp. Okay? You've got to be there. So an eyewitness had the... You've got to be really bored to write that down. I'm just saying. And you're an eyewitness to this. And then, of course, in Numbers 11, I don't know exactly what all this means, but the, the, the person who wrote this down who describes manna, all right, the food that God gave Israel in the wilderness, says it tasted like coriander seed. I've never eaten that, but some of you health food people might know what that means. Um... And then he talks about how they, they made it, and the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. Well, I'm good with the oil. Amen. We're in the South. We like oil. We like to fry stuff. So um, anyhow, right? This is like a personal testimony. So whoever wrote these things lived it, experienced it, was personally involved. Let me just stop there for a minute. Any questions so far about all that info I just threw at you before we keep rolling? Any questions? Why is this important to make such a big deal about Moses being the author? Well, it's a big deal because a lot of people attack Moses as the author. And understanding Moses as the author is going to help us understand Genesis through Deuteronomy so much more when we get into interpretation and content. So there have been some arguments against Moses being the author that began in the 19th and 20th centuries, basically um, with the rise of what is called higher criticism, um, the rejection of the Bible as the inspired word of God. There also arose some attacks on the trustworthiness of Scripture. And in particular, the, uh, the book of Genesis, probably the most... Why do you think in the eight, late 1800s and early 1900s people really attacked Genesis? One reason. There's only one reason. The origin of species, the origin of species right? The theory... Of what? Of evolution. Because it's in direct, and I would say it's the hypo it's not even a theory, really. You can't test it. Evolution is not a theory. It's a hypothesis. It's an idea. It can't be tested in, you know, there's no science involved in evolution. There's just not. Um, it's a hypothetical hypothesis. But all that to say, that's why all of a sudden people are doubting Genesis is the word of God. Moses is the author. God gave it. That is trustworthy, okay? In that period. So the first person who uh, kind of starts to doubt Moses as the author was in the year 1670, a Jewish scholar by the name of Benedict Spinoza. 
he gave the idea that maybe it was Ezra who actually wrote the Pentateuch and that, or at least was the final editor of the Pentateuch around the year 500 BC. So he began this idea of doubting Moses as the primary author. And then in the 19th century, all of a sudden, there is like all these tacks on the, the belief that Moses was the author and this is the word of God. The most famous person was a man named Julius Wellhausen. And he came up with a theory called the documentary theory of the Torah or the Pentateuch. And by the way, when I was in Bible college, I'm old enough that when I was there, they were actually teaching this. Um, it's less taught today, but it's still around. And I remember when I came to this church in the year 2004, there was books in the library of former pastors and from the Southern Baptist Convention. And I started looking at them because I was interested. They all ended up in the dumpster because they were teaching in Sunday school literature taught in this church back in the 70s in the days of liberalism in the SBC. Moses was not the author of Genesis. There were multiple authors. Uh, evolution is true. All this kind of stuff. Southern Baptists were very liberal about 30 years ago, okay? There was something called the conservative resurgence that happened that changed that. There was a time when Southern Baptists were pro-abortion and um, did, just denied the, the truthfulness of Scripture. So a lot of people don't realize that, but that is actually very true. And so uh, these books promoted this very theory. So I want to tell you about it, even though it's not as popular today, only more in academic circles. But a lot of pastors preach like this is true. And I can sniff them out a mile away, okay? They don't ever, no one would be stupid enough to stand up on Sunday morning and say, I believe in the documentary hypothesis of Wellhausen, and um, I deny the mosaic authorship of Genesis. They're not that dumb, because first off, the congregation would be asleep. And I, I'm holding you to a higher standard. This is a class, so I want you to know. However, they will stand up there, and they will attack Genesis as being uh, God breathed and as being history and as being poetry and they will argue against the details in a very clever scientific uh, very liberal biased archaeological way to bring doubt into people's minds to cover up for the horrid attack that is currently going on on human sexuality issues right if Genesis isn't real what's the big deal about Homosexual marriage. What's the whole idea about affirming a gender, right? What's the big deal about origins of the earth? If Genesis isn't real, you can get away with a whole lot of stuff, which we're going to see in a few minutes. And it's tied back to this idea of the JEDP theory. So what this theory says, in brief, is that the first five books of the Bible were not written by Moses. And in fact, um, there were five different people, or four different people, sometimes five different people, mattering uh, your theory, that uh, were the scribes who wrote and recorded this material, and they wrote it as if they were Moses. So we call that today forgery, right? They wrote it like they were Moses under his authority, but the reality was they were um, giving their version of Israel's history. And at some point, it all got put together and made it into the Bible. But that was way later. This stuff was written way after Moses. So <clears throat> here's the four authors under the JEDP theory. All right, this is what's taught by a lot of pastors. And there's a lot of older pastors that really hold to this. And there's some younger ones too. First off, J. The J author, remember in the old English, if you use the King James Version, instead of Yahweh, so when you see the name of God in all capitals, L-O-R-D, all capitals, the old King James translated that Jehovah. Remember that? Um, we know better now from Hebrew that a better translation of that would be Yahweh. But same idea, all right? This is the, the proper name of God. So they say there is a Yahweh author. And the Yahweh author lived around the year 850 B.C. 850 B.C. He was from the southern kingdom of Judah. And... He recorded certain sections of the Old Testament that emphasized the name Yahweh or Jehovah, if you were using the King James Version. So there are sections in the Bible where you see Yahweh mentioned a lot. I'll give you an example. They would say that there's a different author between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Why? 
In Genesis chapter 1, the name for God that's used over and over is the second one here, E, Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. But then all of a sudden in chapter 2, guess who shows up? Yahweh. The name Yahweh is there. So they would say the, the Yahwehist, all right, wrote chapter 1. That was the first editor. Excuse me. The Elohimist wrote chapter 1, all right? And then there was a second editor who wrote chapter 2. And at some point, someone came around and put them together to start the book of Genesis. So we knew how the world began. And they would say there's contradictions between these two chapters. And because there's contradictions, this must just be some sort of poetry to just give a concept or idea. But this is not literal history, and it's not God-breathed, and it's not Moses' words. So you know the second author is the Elohimist. And that person lived in the northern kingdom of Israel around the year 750 B.C., so about 100 years after the Yahwehists. And uh, this person recorded the sections that emphasized the name of God, Elohim. And then the third author, the D, is the Deuteronomist, okay? The author of Deuteronomy. Someone different wrote that. Someone under the, the high priest Hilkiah during the days of Josiah, the king of Israel, around the year 621 B.C. There was a third editor who came up with the book of Deuteronomy. And that's why there's differences between the law in Exodus and the law in Deuteronomy. There's different words used and things like that because there must have been two different authors. That's what they're going to say. And then lastly, the P stands for a priestly author. So someone from the days of Ezekiel to Ezra, from the years 590 to 458, recorded the section of Leviticus and other priestly sections, but primarily Leviticus. And so that's why they would say there's differences in the first five books of the Old Testament because there's four different authors and they were editing and changing and copying and pasting. And maybe by the days of Ezra, it was all together. All right, that's what they would argue. And so this really changes the way we would read the Bible, doesn't it? And how we would interpret the Bible. If it wasn't Moses given by God, instead, if there was these bunch of these editors who were cutting and pasting, um, you know, it's like uh, our youth leaders, we have a Google Doc, okay, for our calendar. And I've given permission for any of our youth leaders to go in to the Google Doc, and we have, a, we have the calendar, who, like tonight, there was four, four leaders had to be on the, on the docket to serve tonight. Well, someone got into the Google Doc, and guess what? They didn't know how to use it properly. And they made some goof-ups on it. And I won't name them tonight, so I don't embarrass them. They're not as tech-savvy. So guess what I had to do? Go back and correct all their mistakes and errors. Well, imagine if you had like five or six people trying to edit the document at once. You could quickly lose track of what? Who said what? When they said it? All of a sudden, you've got mistakes creeping in. That's what these people are saying about Genesis and the Deuteronomy. That's what they're saying, which is why they don't trust it. Now, unlike those views, we believe that Moses really was the author and that he primarily wrote these things the last 40 years of his life, 1446, all right, till when he died at the end of that, that season of his life. And we believe that because of all that evidence I showed you. And that is very important. Now, here's what I do want to say, okay? I want to say this that um, there were editors to the books of Moses in a few places. I'm going to argue there was one editor, and I share his name, okay? His name was Joshua, who added a few final details on the books of Genesis to Deuteronomy, as well as recording what other book? That was rocket science, right? The writer of Joshua was Joshua. So... I'm going to presume and assume, because of all of those verses that tell us Moses was the author, that there was a final editor who added a few details, and that was Joshua. So, let me prove that to you why I, I believe that. First off, in Genesis chapter 14, verse 14, we hear in this passage here, Abraham heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive. He led forth his trained men, born in his house, and they went in pursuit as far as what? Dan. Now, 
Does anyone remember who Dan is? One of the sons of Jacob, of Israel, right? And one of the what? The tribes that follow of Israel. Now, here's the question. Did Abraham know Dan? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Dan. We're talking three generations later. All right, Abraham is, is uh, great, great grandpa to Dan, okay? Doesn't know him. Yet the author of this book says they went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now I'm going to go a step further. Does Moses know the tribal allotment of Dan? Does he ever know it? Why not? He dies before they get into the promised land, right? Who divvies up the promised land? Joshua does, okay? And then Israel goes and takes the land, including Dan is given their segment of land. So Moses could not have said, when he was recording the sacred history of Abraham, that Abraham chased them as far as Dan. But Joshua could have added that detail, right? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we knew exactly how far he went. That's pretty easy. How about this one? Genesis 36, 31. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. How many kings of Israel did Moses know about? Zip. <laughs> because there were no kings yet in Israel's history. Now, it is interesting, however, there are some laws about if Israel were to get a king one day in the book of Deuteronomy. All right? So it is possible that Moses writing this could have said before there was any kings reigning in Israel, knowing that one day there's been laws given in case there is a king. Or it could be that there was an editor who added that statement later. In this case, I would prefer to say probably Moses did write this because he knew there would be kings later because God gave him laws about kings. Let's look at the next one. Genesis 47, 11. Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them possession in the land of Egypt um, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Now, here's the problem, okay? Ramses is not a king of Egypt until way after Moses, all right? He's not the Pharaoh until way after Moses. But he did live during the time of Joshua. And Joshua could have given us the name of, Fair, of Ramses because he knew it. So he could have added that name as a later editor. And then the last and most important one of all, turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy 34, please. I want you to turn there. I know we'll, we'll actually read Genesis in a minute. But this is all introductory. Deuteronomy 34. I'm assuming Moses did not write this chapter. This is the last chapter of the Pentateuch. And the reason why I assume Moses did not write this chapter is because it's the account of his death. Okay? Now, could he have written it in a prophetical way and God gave him the words? That's surely possible. However, it seems more likely to me that Joshua, who is an inspired author and prophet and leader of Israel and successor to Moses, came and he added the last chapter to the book of Deuteronomy. That seems more likely to me. So, Deuteronomy 34 Verses 1 through 12. We're not going to read it all. But notice what it says. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah. The Lord showed him all the land. Verse 2, all, the, all Naphtali, Ephraim, Manasseh, and it goes on and on. Then verse 4, Yahweh said to him, this is the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. Verse 5, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of Yahweh. And he buried him in a valley. God buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beit Peor, and no one knows his grave to this day. That's an interesting statement, right? Joshua didn't even know. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim. His natural vigor was not diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. The days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Notice this. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, Moses had laid his hands on him, and the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord God had commanded him. We'll stop right there. I would assume Joshua wrote that section, okay? 
um, or some other prophet. So was there an editor there? Yeah, I think someone probably added that. That's a reasonable thought. But there is no evidence to say that there was four different authors all during this different time that wrote in a pseudopigraphal way, a false way, uh, as in a deceptive way. I don't think that is at all even close to the truth. And that idea should be uh, far from our minds. But I just wanted to make you aware of it, and you're going to see why it's important in a minute. So let's talk about the big picture of the book. How do we outline the book of Genesis and think about it in the big picture? Moses is the author, primarily. How do we split it up? If you were going to teach, so here, here's the deal. Um, your neighbor accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and comes with you to church. Praise God, right? And you get him a Bible. You say, Pastor, can I give him a Bible? We've always got Bibles here, by the way. So you can, you can ask me that any time and I'll get you one. So we give him a Bible. And he says, you know, it's a big book. I'm a little nervous even starting to read it. You mind sitting with me and looking at Genesis with me and just, just kind of get me going a little bit? And you're like, uh-oh, uh, let me find my Old Testament survey notes <laughs> so I can kind of introduce you to this. How do you outline the book and think about the big picture with your new neighbor? So this is how, uh, there's two different ways that you can really outline this book. And I'm going to give you the two best ways, I believe. Number one is you can separate, there's chapters 1 through 11, and then there's chapters 12 through 50. Chapters 1 through 11 are the primeval history of the world. In other words, uh, the originations of the world, the earliest stages of history before Abraham. That's chapters 1 through 11. And then from chapter 12 on, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the patriarchs. God's chosen patriarchs of Israel. So you can think of it this way. What is primeval history? You got four big events. Creation, the fall of man, the flood of Noah, and how the nations of the world developed. Okay? That's all. So evolutionists talk a lot about something. They use this expression. Prehistoric. All right? Christian, you should not use that term. Because there is no such thing as prehistoric. Uh, times. This doesn't exist, okay? When they talk about prehistoric, who are they talking about? Cavemen and dinosaurs, right? Uh, well, we're going to see, hopefully, that uh, there is no such thing as prehistory, because you can't get earlier than creation, fall, flood nations. So all history is God's history, because prehistory would be pre-God, okay? There's no such thing. God's eternal, and he started time. Now, after that, you have the patriarchal history, how the Hebrew race and the people of God came into existence. You've got Abraham in chapters 12 to 20, Isaac in 21 to 26, Jacob 27, 36. The end of the book is Joseph 37 to 50. All right. I would not recommend probably that you do a five-year study of Genesis with your new Christian friend. But I would give them the big picture and say, let's talk about the creation of the world, week one. Let's talk about the flood. The fall, excuse me, week two. The flood, week three. How the nations. That way we could deal with creation, the image of God, sin, evolution, right? Judgment, the second coming of Jesus, um, racism. You could deal with all of that right there. And then I'd say, let me tell you about the four big characters in Genesis. And just talk about their lives with them and you can show them some verses, all right? Now it's not so overwhelming to break up the book of Genesis, right? So you got two big sections, 1 to 11, second section, 12 to 50. Primeval history, patriarchal history. There's a second way to look at it, which is a little more academic, but also a very accurate view. And again, what is the Greek title of the book? Genesis, origins, the account of, the beginning of. Well, that expression, these are the origins of, is found all throughout the book, which is why I think the Septuagint translators chose to make that the title and why Matthew begins his title as a second Genesis, right? All of those or all of these people's lives have set make sense because of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, the origins of Jesus Christ. All of these generations are pointing forward to Jesus. So here's another way you could break it down in just a literary way. You notice here that each one of these sections that I show you of these different lives um, are a major figure in the book. And they all begin with these are, this is the account of, or the generations of, or the histories of. And so when Moses wrote the book, 
being that he was a prince of Egypt and a pretty smart guy, I think every time he introduced a new section, he used this expression. This is the origins of the heaven and earth when God created. These are the descendants, the genesis of Adam. These are the descendants, the genesis of Noah. These are the, the genesis, the descendants of Shem, the son of Noah, and Ham, and Japheth, and so on. Does that make sense? So that's another way you could look at it from a literary way. That's a very important expression, hence the title of the book. Now, there's a few different ways that you could understand Genesis, mattering if you believe in the JEDP theory, or you believe what we're actually trying to propose to you, that Moses was the author, God inspired the word, it's true history, it is literary, it is poetry, but it's exalted prose, and it's, it's beautiful. So there's a few ways you can read this. Most pastors today in liberal churches read this as legend, as legend. Do you remember how I um, talked about the accommodation theory like a few weeks back? That Jesus was an accommodator? So he did not actually believe there was a Noah and a worldwide flood. But to accommodate the simplistic people that he was talking to, he talked about Noah like he was a real person. Remember that? And yet he wasn't actually saying Noah was real. Well, that's what a lot of pastors do. So, for instance, there was a, a pastor at a very large church in Pensacola, um, who thankfully is not the pastor there anymore, but he was there a long time. And he was talking about Jonah. And from the pulpit, he said, now, uh, this story of Jonah didn't actually happen. This is a legend that someone recorded. It, it's kind of like, um, you know, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, okay? There's a moral here. There's a story here. There's a lesson here that we can learn from this passage. But it's legend, all right? Don't read this like this was a real account. The problem is, did Jesus treat the story of Jonah like a real account? He actually says, just like Jonah, it was three days and, and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Um, the same way here. They'll say, well, the Adam and Eve story, it's kind of a legend. You got to have a beginning somewhere. And this is what the Elohimists came up with and the Yahwehist writers came up with. So when they talk about Adam and Eve, it's kind of like a cute story. And it come of, you know, they, when they talk about, their, you, know, you picture like a children's storybook Bible, and there's these little, cute little leaves covering up the privates of, of Eve and Adam, and uh, it's just like a cute story. And when you talk about Noah and the flood, you know, you, you see this cute little children's ark that's in a lot of nurseries, which drives me crazy, with these stupid-looking little animals' heads popping out. It looks so unrealistic. It's just like just some random, cute legend, right? Not like real, literal history. Okay, and that's how a lot of people read it or that it's a myth. It's myth. It's mythic literature that uh, it's been preserved. It's important only from its literary value because it's been around forever. It's just not true. Others read Genesis in particular chapter one is like a hymn. So they would say because the language is somewhat poetic and it's exalted, it's beautiful language. It has a rhythm to it. We'll see in a moment. Um, it has repetitions in it, parallelisms in it. This is like a hymn. Someone wrote this this creation account as something you could sing. Uh, they, they have a lot of repetition so you could memorize it and tell it to the next generation because people were so dumb back then they didn't know how to write, which is also not true. Um, and so they kind of, uh, you know, just like parents pass down nursery rhymes to their kids. I'll use the Humpty Dumpty one again since I just used it earlier. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Why in the world do I know that? Evidently, my parents said it way too much to me. I wish they would have like read Psalm 23 to me as much as they read Humpty Dumpty because I, I wish I didn't have to figure out how to memorize that when I was 18 and a new Christian. It would have been far better if I'd memorized it when I was three, right? But, you know, you, you, uh, you just pass these stories down. And then other people say that this is theological history. And that's what we believe this is. This is literal, historical history and poetical. So what would I say, like Genesis 1, for instance, I think God gives Moses a vision of the creation of the world, the drama of creation. And what we call this literature, we called it, the technical term is exalted prose 
narrative, which if you want to write that down and Google those three words, exalted prose narrative. If you were an English major, you know what that means. If you were not an English major, you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's exalted language. It's beautiful language. There's prose in it. There's also narrative. Narrative means telling of a story, a true story, a literal story that happened. But it's not written in a boring, bland way. It's written in a beautiful way. God is, I mean, listen, why would we not expect God to write in a beautiful way? How did God create the universe? And do we see in black and white? <laughs> right? Have you ever looked at some of the amazing creations of God, the intricacy, the detail, the baffling things that we see in the creation? Right? God is not boring by any means. And so when you read the Bible, this is exalted prose narrative. There's repetition, there's parallelism, there's recapitulation. So Genesis 1 is a creation account. And Genesis 2 expands on that creation account in a deeper way and tells us more about who Adam and Eve were. They're not two different stories written by two different authors. One story expanded beautifully. Um, it's very important how you read the Bible. So let's just end tonight by uh, thinking this way, okay? Why does Genesis 1 through 11 matter? I just want to ask that question. If you take this as myth or legend, you're really in trouble. And this is the reason why. Hear this quote from Ken Ham. When you build a house, you build from the foundation up, not from the roof down. You need the right foundation for everything else to be built upon. The Bible is, in essence, similar to the first book, Genesis, is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. So the house of the Bible is built on the foundation of Genesis. And there are some really important things that we have no answer for if you don't believe that Moses, inspired by God, gave us the exalted prose narrative, beautiful language describing Genesis chapters 1 through 11, the creation of the world and uh, the origins of humanity. So let's think about some of these doctrines that you lose if you don't believe in Genesis 1 through 11, written by Moses' as author, inspired by God, true historical, beautiful, poetic language, all right? Um, I'm just going to, first off, let me ask you, what are some doctrines you might lose? There's a lot, so. The Trinity, I, I think you do see, I don't know if you would lose the Trinity, but you lose the foundations of it, right? I mean, just in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image. That's an echo of the Trinity. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God, verse 3, moved upon the waters. So there's one example. What else? Religion is all about. It's a lot. Throw something out. So let's stop, slow down. The doctrine of God. Who is God? He's eternal. Does, is God created in Genesis chapter 1? It begins with God's existence already. In the beginning, God was created. No, in the beginning, God. He stands outside of time. You said the doctrine of man. Uh, let's think about that. How do we know that we have value inherently and we're different than animals? We were made in the image, not the galaxy, not the animals. I saw an advertisement from PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or as my son likes to say, People for the Eating of Tasty Animals. Um, PETA had this advertisement the other day, and they said, you need to stop dehumanizing animals. Stop using animal names as bad language. Stop calling people snakes. Snakes are actually very lovely creatures. Stop calling people, I don't know, can I say this in church? Asses, okay? That's what it said. Because donkeys are actually um, very loving and affectionate. And, you know, it went on and on, the list of all these terms we use. It, 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 stop dehumanizing animals. That's what it said, okay? Yeah, they're not humans, right. So the reason why we can talk about animals that way and characterize them, and we can't talk about people that way is why? The image of God. They're not eternal. We are, we're made in the image of God. We bear attributes that God has given, and we are eternal beings. They are not. 
So that's another doctrine. How about the doctrine of what we are created for? What did God say to Adam in the garden? Be fruitful, multiply, and what? Fill the earth, subdue the earth. So uh, have children, right? Fill the earth, work the earth. You have a purpose in this world. Why do we have a work ethic? Genesis 1 through 11. Why should you work? Genesis 1 through 11. Here, here's another one for you. Why do you have a seven-day work week? Where did that come from? All right. Why do we work six days and rest on the seventh day? Why, is there seven, like, why isn't there an eight-day work week or a 14-day work week? Right? Because uh, God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Um, how about human sexuality? Why are we male and female? God, not a politician or a panel of social engineers, gave the foundation for the correct approach to gender. You get rid of Genesis. You've got no argument for that. You can, you can have things instead of he's and she's and all the other weird uh, pronouns that our wicked world is trying to force on people. How about a marriage? Why is marriage between a man and a woman? Again, God, not a panel of judges, created marriage. Before there was even government, marriage was before government, right? Government doesn't come to Genesis chapter uh, 9. When God institutes with Noah the death penalty. Before then, marriage was in the beginning, even in Eden. How about the doctrine of clothing? Why should we wear clothes? Why should Christians be against nude beaches and immodest attire? Well, you have a conscience that tells you it's not right, yes. But also because of sin, God gave clothing, right? When we became aware of it, why do animals not wear clothing except for Weird people like my wife who put these cute little outfits on the chihuahua. Cringe, right? Um, why do animals not care that they don't have an, an outfit on? But we feel a guilt, a sense of shame because of sin, foreshadowing the sacrifice, the covering we need in Jesus Christ. How about the doctrine of evil and Satan? How do we know Satan is not a personification of evil? He's a real person. Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man. Why is there death and suffering in the world? If you don't have Genesis 3, you don't know why there's death in the world. You don't know why there's suffering in the world. You would think, I mean, Genesis 1 says over and over, God made everything what? Good. You get rid of Genesis chapter 1 and 3. I don't know why there's death in the world. No answer. The Bible doesn't give an answer. You really can't answer that properly. How about the nature of sin? The core of sin is what? Rejecting God's word. What was the first thing that Satan, the serpent, did with Eve? Question God's word. Has God really said? Yea, has God said? Remember that. Who will you trust and obey? Who will you listen to? The gospel is found in Genesis. We need a savior because Adam, the father, the head of the human race, sinned and brought real death into the world in Genesis 3. And that's why Jesus had to literally come, bodily come, and die a literal, physical death to take our place. What about racism? How do you answer racism? I mean, you got Darwinian theology saying that there's all these different races in the world. The original Darwinists said that uh, the Caucasoids, the Caucasians, were the highly evolved race. And then below them were the Negroids and the Mongoloids and the Australoids, all right? Disgusting, right? Actually, no, there's only one race, Adam's race. And we have ethnicities that comes from Adam's race in Genesis chapter 10 and 11 at the Tower of, ba of Babel. In Genesis, just in, in general, you see the origin of the universe, the origin and order of complexity of life, the different kinds, right? The species, speciesism. You see, and we see that species should not interspecies, right? Uh, they're different kinds, and they should not try to come together. That's sinful. You see the origin of man, the origin of life, the origin of the atmosphere, the origin of the hydrosphere, the origin of solar systems, the origin of marriage, the origin of evil, the origin of language. Why do we talk? The origin of government, um, the origin of culture, the origin of nations, the origin of religion, the origin of the nation of Israel. I'm supposed to go farther tonight, but I'll stop right there. All right. It's important how you read and understand Genesis. So last couple minutes, questions. Unless you just want to go home. Okay. So do you think that Darwin's title for his book on the origin of species, when you look at the word Genesis and you look at the name origin, do you think it was deliberate 
yes. an affront to the Bible and his origin. I think it was because of Darwin's uh, religious background, coming from a, a very religious background. I think it was a direct attack on the authority of God's word. And not to sound too judgmental, but I'm just going to go for it because I think it's true because it's so evil. I think that the contents of Darwin's book are evil. We have genocides, racism, Nazism, all coming from Darwin, in my opinion. And I think it, it was just like Satan saying, did God really say? And so it's a blasphemous, false genesis of how the world came into existence. So yeah, I would say so. But I've got a lot of scientists angry at me right now. But they're pseudoscientists anyhow, if they're going to say that. What else? I think that they can be. In particular, I, I was talking about Noah's Ark. When kids think of Noah's Ark, they usually don't think of it as a literal true story because of those ridiculous pictures. And some children's Bibles, yes. Now, I've seen, there are a few really good ones out, which I have in my office. If you remind me, I can tell you which ones. I can't tell you the names now. But yeah, I think some of them are really detrimental because they're not even written by Christians. They're published by organizations that are not even, they're just making money off people. And they're cute, right, which is even more dangerous because the Bible is not cute, okay? But it makes it cute. So I think we should be careful because we are building presuppositions into our children. Now, there are, there are some good children's Bibles out there, though. So you don't have to buy one that's made by um, HarperCollins, who also prints pornography, you know? Like, you don't have to buy one from a liberal organization. There are some good ones out there. But, yeah, like, I would never allow a cheesy, you know, Noah's Ark in our nursery ever because I think we are putting an image into people's minds that is far from true. You know, and it's starting that unbelief at an early age. So. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, on, oh, yeah, go ahead. There's nothing wrong with it. I just think a better scholar, people much smarter than me, um, looking at the evidence would say the better pronunciation is Yahweh. Here's an example of that, all right? When we pronounce the name Israel, we don't say Jizreel, right? We say Israel. Why? Because in Hebrew, it's Yod. Why? Not J as in Je Jehovah. It's Y. So... That's, I mean, pretty much all Hebrew scholars, including modern Jews, when they see that letter, the Yod, which remember when we talked about the Jod or the Tittle, that's the Yod, they pronounce it like a Y. So that being the case, Yahweh just is more accurate. It's not a sin to call him Jehovah. God knows for a short period of time in English history, Jehovah was the preferred way to pronounce that name. So you wouldn't use your behavior. I would say Yahweh. Well, no, there are places in the Old Testament where God is called Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. So it, that's, there's nothing wrong with that if you're finding that in a text in the Bible. But the, the covenant name of God is Yahweh. We're going to get into this in future weeks. The name Elohim is a more general name for God, and we'll talk about that.